Our scripture reading today is from Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman, woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came but she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and he said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus then, then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great, and it shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. This passage of Scripture has caused a great deal of discussion over the centuries since it occurred. A lot of people look at Jesus as someone who is the answerer of questions. And yet on one occasion he doesn't answer the question. Jesus seems to be the Savior of all mankind. But it almost seems that an element of this particular story suggests racism on the part of our Savior. There are a lot of things that people have looked at regarding this passage of Scripture that have caused question. And this morning we're going to take a look at some of these and see if we can find the answers that God intends for us to find in this passage. First of all, I want us to be mindful of something that gives us a little bit of a backdrop to this story. And it's found in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 26. And it reads that Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. When we take a look at this passage of Scripture, this backdrop from Mark's Gospel account, it helps us to understand a little bit about what's going on here. First of all, we find Jesus in the region of Tyre. This is a place uh, in Sidon, two cities over on the Mediterranean coast. They were places that had been conquered years earlier by Alexander the Great, and so they were Greek cities in and of themselves. But Jesus, we see in Mark 7 and verse 24, wanted to get away. Perhaps as Jesus did on many occasions, he wanted time to pray. But certainly being with the people and being with them so much, teaching them, feeding them both physically and even spiritually was very taxing on him. He wanted to get away, but when people are popular, that's something that's very difficult for them to do. And it says that even though he wanted to get away, verse 24 at the close says he could not escape notice. We are then introduced to a woman who has a daughter, again, according to Mark's translation or Mark's gospel account as an unclean spirit, this daughter who was inhabited by this demon possession. And in verse 20, we read that this woman was of a Syrophoenician race, a Gentile. It's important for us to remember that our Savior was born and raised and lived and died a Jew, a child of Israel of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this sets for us a little bit of a backdrop for what we're going to take a look at this morning from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21, verses 20 through 21. I'm going to have to have... There you go, Chris. Thank you very much. There we go. From Matthew chapter... I'm going to have to hit it again, Chris. 
There we go. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. We're going to take a look at the patience, the perseverance, and the persistence of a mother. A lot of places call this the, the story of the Canaanite woman. Some translations call it the Syrophoenician woman, as we would learn from Mark's gospel account. But I want us to take a look at a little bit more as to what this story is really all about and especially how it applies to us this morning. Because when we see this story, we see not a story of race, uh, not a story of great miracle. We see a story of someone who loved her child, someone whose child was ill, in this case with possession, and someone who wanted their child whole and someone who was willing to do all she could to bring that healing about. That's what we're going to take a look at this morning, but we're going to do so this morning by taking a look at a conversation that takes place between this Canaanite woman and Jesus the Christ. We're going to take a look at four things that were said or not said by the woman and four responses said or not said by the Christ. The very first one we're going to take a look at is when the woman comes up to Jesus, she says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Notice the acknowledgement that she makes right off the bat. She says, Have mercy on me, Lord. She is recognizing that Jesus is greater than she is by referring to him as her master. But something else that she throws in there, she tacks on son of David. Now, according to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the beginning of Matthew's genealogical account of the line of Jesus, we would understand that he was referred to as the son of David or of the line of David. And David, of course, was the king of Israel at its apex. And so David was considered the great king of all of the Israelites. So to be born of his bloodline would make you born of a royal bloodline. So the woman here is not only suggesting that Jesus is the master, but she is suggesting that Jesus is the Messiah. The one who was prophesied would be born in Bethlehem of the line of that great king, David. We read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24, that news about Jesus spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, throws in their epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them, included right in the middle of Matthew 4 and verse 24, are demoniacs, people who are demon-possessed. So it would make sense that if this woman had heard that the Master had come, the Messiah had come and he was the same one performing all of these miracles in the region around. It would make sense that if he could heal someone else of demon possession, he could heal her daughter as well. So she comes to him, respectfully acknowledges him as someone with great power who can make her daughter well. And what is Jesus' response? Nothing. Absolute silence. Now we see Jesus doing this on other occasions. Jesus was silent once upon a time when a woman who was caught in adultery was brought to him. He wasn't going to engage the scribes and the Pharisees who were doing this just to trap him. Even when he had the opportunity to rebuke those who were accusing him as he was being ready to be crucified, Jesus remained silent because he came here for the purpose of of dying on that cross. But here is a woman who has a real daughter who's in real pain and she really wants healing to come to her child. She's not someone who's trying to set Jesus up. She's not trying to trip him or trap him or trying to bring his demise earlier in his life. No, she's someone who is sincere, who is genuine and who asks Jesus to help her. And he responds by saying nothing. Let's take a look at the next dialogue that takes place in this conversation. Because we do not have an account of what the woman is shouting, I included at this point simply what the disciples say about her. The disciples say to Jesus about the woman, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. Now, I don't think she was shouting something mean or cruel or derogatory. 
I think what she is doing is she is continuing to shout to Jesus' disciples what she was shouting to Jesus. Lord, help me. Those of you who are following him, help me. Somebody, please, help me bring my daughter back to her right frame of mind. The disciples may be taking a cue off of Jesus, perhaps misunderstanding that cue in the first place, but maybe because Jesus does not recognize her in her first comment, they decide to tell Jesus, let's continue all not recognizing her and let's send her away. What was Jesus' response? Chris? Jesus' response was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to think about that statement for just a minute because does it sound exactly like it sounds like? Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The house of Israel were the Jews of whom Jesus was a part. Jesus' entire family, his mother, his father, his sisters, his brothers were all of Jewish descendancy. Is he in fact saying that I came here only to help the Jews and nobody else? Well, perhaps that's not exactly what he was saying because we have evidence that suggests to the contrary. I want you to consider several of the things that we read in other passages in and around this text. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He doesn't say to seek and to save the Jews only. He doesn't say to seek and to save the Gentiles. He, calls, he says that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. And we know from other passages of Scripture in the New Testament that all who have sinned have fallen short of the glory of God are lost. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, when Jesus sent the twelve out, He gave them this instruction, Do not go the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, that sounds a little bit more about like what He's calling, telling this Canaanite woman. But what he's saying is that there is an order to things. We're fond of quoting verses of, uh, verses of Scripture that say things like, uh, we should do all things decently and in order. And Jesus certainly understood this. He started with His people first. From there it would grow. For instance, in Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, before He ascends into heaven and leaves His apostles in charge, He tells them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. Here we see Jesus saying that the gospel is to be preached to all of mankind, Jew and Gentile alike. But it's going to start somewhere and that place would be Jerusalem just a few days later just 10 days after he makes this statement on the day of Pentecost Peter and the rest of the Apostles would proclaim the good news of Jesus and the church would begin and the gospel would spread into Judea the surrounding area of Jerusalem and into Samaria where there were people living that because of their descendancies uh, Jesus' people looked down upon them and then to the rest of the world which would include all Gentiles everywhere. Jesus certainly wanted all people everywhere to be saved. Why then would He make this statement to the woman? Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Maybe what Jesus was saying was that I'm not ready for you yet. Maybe what Jesus was saying is my people first, then you. But I think that there was something more to that. I think this is part of the challenge that Jesus is bringing about to this woman and perhaps to us as well. Let's take a look at the third dialogue between the woman and Jesus. She cries out, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. 
If we were sick, would we not cry out to a doctor, help me? If our child was hurting, would we not cry out to a healer, help me? And if we truly understand sin and we realize that Jesus is the Savior, would we not cry out the very same thing? Do we not cry out to Him that same thing today? Lord, help me. When the Canaanite woman cries this out, Jesus responds by saying it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. If you had a problem with Jesus' silence, that was probably trumped by Jesus saying, Jews first, then the Greeks. But that was probably overshadowed by this response. Is Jesus saying again what he appears to be saying? Is he not only playing a race card, but is he literally putting down someone who is not of his race? Is he indeed calling this Gentile woman a dog? The answer is yes, but not to be mean, not to be racial. Jesus did not share the sinful prejudices that we sometimes share today. Jesus was saying this for a purpose. And again, I go back to the text surrounding, uh, to the books and the epistles that are written around this particular account that help us to understand this. For instance, we read in Acts chapter 10, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 48, where Peter, who is a Jew like Jesus, where Peter is commanded to go and to teach the household of Cornelius the gospel, the good news to share with them how they can overcome the consequences of their sin and share in the salvation of Peter and his brethren. Peter didn't like that. Peter had to take some direct convincing from the Lord to convince him that what God has made is not unclean. So Peter went to Cornelius and his household, and at the end of the chapter, they were baptized into Christ. You would think that Peter had learned his lesson, but not so. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, Paul shows up on the scene and has to rebuke Peter because although Peter knew better, when he started hanging around some of his physical brethren, he started ignoring some of the Gentiles some of those who are now his spiritual brethren. And there were cause, that was causing a problem in the churches in that area. He was demonstrating prejudice. He was demonstrating racism. But Paul, who would represent the will of the Father and the example of Jesus, rebukes him for his error. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, we are also introduced into a, a passage of Scripture that helps us to see the attitude of Jesus toward Gentiles, the same attitude that He would have toward all of mankind. And that is the desire for their faith and the desire for their salvation. We read in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13 of a centurion who comes to Jesus, a non-Jew, a Gentile centurion, who comes to him imploring him, Lord, my servant is living paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus didn't ignore him. Jesus didn't call out race. Jesus didn't put him down in any way. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me and I say to this one, go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my slave do this and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, said to some of his own kin, to his own family, to his own race, he said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. He was commending a Gentile for his faith. He was commending a Gentile for coming to him to find answers to the problems that only the Christ could resolve. 
So why the different attitude with the Canaanite woman? Why would he go so far as to call this woman a dog? I want to read to you a note from Albert Barnes' commentary that gives a little bit of an explanation, maybe that might be a little bit easier for us to understand. Mr. Barnes writes, Evidently, he cannot un be understood as intending to justify or sanction the use of such terms or calling names. He meant, talking about Jesus, to try her faith. As if he had said, You are a Gentile. I am a Jew. The Jews call themselves children of God. You, they vilify and abuse, calling you a dog. Are you willing to receive of a Jew then a favor? Are you willing to submit these appellations to receive a favor of one of that nation and to acknowledge your dependence on a people that so despise you? It was therefore a trial of her faith and was not a lending of his sanction to the propriety of the abusive term. He regarded her with a different feeling. In the Bible, we see Jesus commending people for their faith. And in the Bible, we also see Jesus commending people for the lengths that they will go to demonstrate that faith. How far will they go to prove that faith? I'm mindful of Abraham in the Old Testament when he's waiting all those years for a child and finally God blesses Abraham and Sarah with Isaac and then when Isaac is a young man, God says, I want you to go and sacrifice your son to me. Abraham was a man of great faith. He was a man who didn't argue with the Lord, didn't try to figure out a different way out. He simply obeyed him and took his son up on a high mountain and was willing to take his life. But he did so with such faith that he actually said to his men, we will come back down later. It's a profound statement. He was going to do everything that God told him to do, no matter the personal consequences, in order to please his God. This woman who understood something about who Jesus was, something about the things perhaps he had taught, certainly something about the things he had done in the healing of those who were like her child. This woman comes to him knowing that he can provide answers and he can provide healing. So even though Jesus ignores her, even though Jesus describes himself as not of her race, and even though Jesus refers to her as a dog, he does all these things to test her faith. He does all these things to see just how far she's willing to go to accomplish her mission. That's why in the final discourse between the Canaanite woman and Jesus, Chris, the woman cries out, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. If somebody came up and called you a dog today, how would you feel? Would you be upset? Would you be offended? Would you pick a fight? Would you retaliate? Would you want vengeance? Or would you turn the other cheek? You see, this woman was not out for personal glory. It was not about her ego. She was there to help save her child. It didn't matter what was said or not said. It didn't matter what delineations were made between one race and another. It didn't even matter that she was called a dog. What mattered was that her child would be made well. So she says to Jesus, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you say to me, let me point out that even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. What did Jesus say? Similar to that Gentile centurion. He said, O woman, 
your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. You know, it's interesting. There are few people that in the New Testament Jesus describes as having a great faith because so oftentimes they just, people were described as having little faith. Even his own disciples were described in this fashion. In Matthew chapter 17, uh, verses 14 through 21, we read the following story. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and he is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out without prayer and fasting. In Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 6, these apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had the faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What Jesus says is, you have great faith. What he said to so many before was, you have little faith. And what he might say to me is the same, you have little faith. But what Jesus wants us to do is to have a great faith. He wants us to have an absolute faith. He wants us to have a faith that is patient. He wants us to have a faith that perseveres. He wants us to have a faith that persists through all of the struggles of this life. Through all of the hardships that we face, through all of the obstacles put in our way, through all of the people who say no and you can't and who ignore us and try to throw every card out there and even call us names. He says, I want you to have a faith that calls on me for help, for guidance, and for strength, no matter what. You see, that's the lesson for us today. The lesson that we learn from this woman is not so much how Jesus responded, because His responses were a test of her faith. But the challenge for us and the lesson for us today is what can we learn from this? And I want us to consider three verses of Scripture to learn from this lesson. The first one is Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, where Jesus said, In all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. I think this has a lot to do with our relationship with God. I think this has a lot to do with our relationship in prayer. How many times do we ask God for something? And we want Him to answer it, but we don't really believe He will. I see this sometimes in the areas of those who are sick, those who are very ill, those who perhaps are dying. I see this in situations when doctors say there's no hope. The nurses write the patient off. Possibly even organizations like hospice are brought in. But brethren, I've witnessed people pray and I've witnessed people pray with a fervent faith. And I've seen people get better. I've seen people come out of hospice. I've seen people come out of the hospital. I've seen people who have had stage 4 cancer later on in complete and total remission. We're not advocating the miraculous works today. What we are advocating is God's providence and God's answer to prayer. The question is, how persistent will we be in our prayer? If we're going to ask God for something, we have to believe that He can answer according to His will what we're asking Him. In James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, James would write, But he must ask in faith without doubting. 
For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Did you notice what he said there? He said he must ask, with faith, ask in faith without doubting. Because to ask with doubt, he says, are like the waves of the sea, tossing a ship back and forth. And do you understand what was going on here? Jesus was throwing the wind out at this woman. Jesus was throwing the rain out at this woman. Jesus was throwing the waves, not little waves, big waves, out at this woman, trying to see just exactly how strong her faith was. And she didn't waver. She couldn't be insulted out of her faith. She couldn't be ignored out of her faith. She could not even be prejudiced out of her faith. And boy, that's a problem we see today. We've got a nation divided in so many ways and we're still divided over issues of race. And some people, because of, of the stupid words of a careless individual, will cause that to bring so much destruction upon their lives that it will even cause their faith to come crashing down. This woman didn't budge. Her faith was strong. Her faith was secure. It was absolute. Chris? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. We're used to quoting this out of the King James Version. Uh, that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I wanted to use a different translation so you could see how it's described in the New American Standard. It, Hebrews 11 and verse 1, giving us the very definition of faith, describes it as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Do you understand what this is saying regarding this Canaanite, Syrophoenician, Gentile woman? This woman's hope in Jesus was sure. This woman's faith in things not seen convicted her to the core of her heart. She just knew that Jesus was special. She just knew that Jesus was powerful. And she knew that Jesus could make her little child well. How about us? How about us? Do we have that kind of faith today? Do we have a faith that is sure? Do we have a faith that is absolute? Do we have trusting confidence that God will do all that He said He will do? That God can do for us even more than we can comprehend? You see, if we learn any lesson, it's from the very last part of the very last verse in our passage. And her daughter was healed at once. Why? Because of her great faith. What can Jesus do for you this morning if you have great faith? I promise you He can give you a joy that is beyond measure, a peace that passes all understanding, and all of the things that you have done wrong in this life, all of the sin that you have committed, He can wash you clean. He can make you whole again. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we all want? For Jesus to make us well? If you're not a child of God this morning, if you have not been baptized into the precious blood of Jesus, if you have not been washed clean of your sin, allow Him based upon your faith the faith that is willing not to just talk about it or think about it, but to live it and to endure it, to be patient, persevere and persist. Allow that faith to bring you into contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus. Be baptized this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you are a child of God, that verse on the, on the wall behind me is still for us. Because we still fall short of the glory of God. We still make mistakes. We still sin. But are we walking in the light as He is in the light? Are we looking to Him for constant healing? Do we ever get to the point to where we say, well, I've just done so much wrong, uh, he, he just can't. I just know he, he can't. I've known of so many people 
who are members of the body of Christ who have strayed away from the truth. They need to come back. They know they need to come back. They even want to come back. But they think that their sin, that their struggles, that their problems are too big for the Lord's healing. There's nothing too big for God. It just requires great faith. It requires the faith of this woman. It requires a faith that is patient when prayers are not always answered as quickly as we'd like them to. It requires a faith that perseveres, that is long-suffering, that is willing to endure many struggles in order to see the race to its end. It requires a faith that is persistent. It doesn't give up. No matter how many times the world tries to knock us down or slap us around, we're going to stand in the strength of the Lord. We're going to have a faith that is absolute and will not waver. I hope that's the kind of faith you have today. But if it's not, God can still heal you. The Lord can still save you. It's up to you. All together we stand and sing.